B. Collins. Peter B. Collins News and Comment. It's Tuesday, March 28th, 2017. Your humble host was away yesterday attending to some business in Southern California. Glad to be back in the saddle. There's plenty to talk about and comment about in the news today. And Donald Trump is still bruised, trying to figure out exactly who to blame for the big debacle in the Obamacare repeal and replacement uh, attempt that failed last Friday. And so regrouping over the weekend, he decided to play a Trump card. And I can use that phrase because I'm actually a bridge player. And if you don't play bridge, it's a game where uh, you bid and the winning bid designates which suit is Trump and Trump beats all other suits. That's a simplification, but you get the idea. And so since uh, he doesn't have traction on health care issues right now, and because the failure of the Obamacare repeal limits his ability to cut taxes, he was going to raid the piggy bank of Obamacare to give tax cuts to the wealthiest Americans. And now the uh, budget math won't work to deliver the kinds of tax cuts that Trump had promised to uh, various constituencies during the campaign. So what do you do? Well, you just go right back to pandering to your base. You throw some red meat out there, and you get them excited and distracted from what has been occurring. And so they trotted out Jeff Sessions, a man who has real <laughs> real hate in his heart. That That's the best way I can describe him. And he was there in the White House press briefing room with Sean Boy Spicer. And he announced new threats to cities and, in some cases, states that have sanctuary policies. And sanctuary policies are simple. In order to win the confidence of people who live in our community, some of whom are not documented, we have policies that publicly state that we do not collaborate with Immigration and Customs Enforcement, ICE. And it makes a lot of sense at the local level. Because we have seen in recent weeks a dramatic decrease in reports of violence in Latino communities, domestic violence. And it's because everybody is afraid to make any contact with the police or to go to a courthouse where ICE agents might be staking out. This fear and intimidation also creates the prospect that crime in these undocumented communities may actually be on the increase. Because if you're a victim of do domestic violence, you are not going to report your abuser because both of you might end up being deported. So it's very sensible. And, of course, Jeff Sessions twisted and misrepresented the facts in many respects. He said, I strongly urge our nation's states and cities and counties to consider carefully the harm they're doing to their citizens by refusing to enforce our immigration laws. Well, he's such a blockhead, he cannot see the perspective of local agencies and police chiefs. So he's threatening to cut off and actually force the clawback or the refunding of federal law enforcement grants that have been paid out or might be paid out in the future to cities like San Francisco, New York. State of California is considering a sanctuary policy statewide. Bill de Blasio in New York said that the latest threat from the Trump administration changes nothing. In New York, Eric Schneiderman, the state's attorney general, called Trump's approach draconian and said, despite what Sessions implied this afternoon, state and local governments and law enforcement have broad authority under the Constitution to not participate in federal immigration enforcement. It's not their job. And trying to be forced to take that on seriously compromises the credibility in local communities. And Jeff Sessions twisted and distorted and lied about one of the cases that he and Trump like to use. It was the shooting death of a San Francisco woman named Kate Steinle and an undocumented man who had been deported five times 
and who had actually been released by the feds to the city and county of San Francisco to face a 19-year-old charge for marijuana possession, which, by the way, is no longer a crime in California. And they tried to make the case that San Francisco failed to turn this guy over to ICE so that he could be deported. But they had him in, a, in an immigration prison in Southern California and sent him to San Francisco. So San Francisco dropped the old charges against him and released him. And then the other bizarre angle of this case is that somehow this undocumented man came into possession of a pistol that had been stolen from the back of a car of a federal agent. Now, you don't hear Jeff Sessions talking about gun issues, about the failure of law enforcement officers to maintain control of their weapons, or even the general notion of gun control, because, of course, that doesn't fit this pro-NRA administration. But the fear will ripple through our communities. I happen to operate my studio here in an area that is predominantly Latino. And we know that most of my neighbors here are undocumented. And the fear is palpable. And to what end? Meanwhile, the distraction of the Russia-Trump investigation continues. And the calls for Devin Nunes, the House Republican chair of the Intelligence Committee, to recuse himself, well, that's really just a start. Now, Clearly, Nunes has compromised himself. He has shown that he's carrying water for the White House. Essentially, the White House and the president are suspects in this investigation. And he shared evidence with suspects and then shared it with the public that he hadn't shared with members of his committee, including the minority Democrats. And let me retract the word evidence that I just used. It was information. <laughs> And it was hardly conclusive. So I think Democrats should be demanding that Devin Nunes step down as chair of the Intelligence Committee. He's shown that he cannot handle classified material, that he is partisan and political despite his own denials. When uh, he said he's not going to resign, he said it's the same thing as always around this place. A lot of politics. People get heated. But I'm not going to get to I'm not going to involve myself with that. Well, come on, that's such bullshit. He has. He has politicized this by making statements, trying to diminish the uh, perceived law-breaking or violations or uh, questionable acts by members of Trump's team. And, uh, you know, he canceled the hearing that was supposed to be held today with Sally Yates and John Brennan and Jimmy Clapper. We don't know why. And so I do support uh, a full-throated attack on Nunes, and he should be forced to resign his post as chair of the very critical House Intelligence Committee. And, of course, the committee should not be conducting this investigation. It should be an outside counsel. I don't trust these commissions, the whitewash commissions. And, of course, getting an independent counsel from the Trump administration with Jeff Sessions, who's had to recuse himself already, Oh, it's a mess. A big mess. And meanwhile, Trump, the distractor, tweeting out yesterday, uh, yesterday, last evening, why isn't the House Intelligence Committee looking into the Bill and Hillary deal that allowed big uranium to go to Russia? And a Russian speech that he's referring to Bill Clinton getting a big fat paycheck for. Well, I have no objection to the FBI investigating, investigating those, but this neener neener approach by Trump is not going to work. And as you know, I've been highly skeptical of all these claims made by intelligence officials, embraced by political leaders, and treated as fact by the media because there's no evidence that Russia hacked the DNC computer, the servers. That, that's a fundamental issue that is now just bulldozed over, and it's treated as fact. I heard Michael Hayden, the former CIA and NSA director on the radio last night, and he just said, oh, yeah. We know that. We know that Russia got into the DNC computers and John Podesta's email. That's bullshit. At least so far as we know, there is no public evidence for that. So here is a more sober and uh, 
I think, very factual and neutral recap of what's called The Russian Job, subtitled The Plot Thickens. And it's by the esteemed professor from the University of Michigan, Juan Cole, who I've talked with many times over the years. He says, The evidence for collusion between Trump figures and the Russian Federation to gain the White House for Trump is still mostly circumstantial. Keep that in mind. Now, we're seeing a lot of dots connected with Paul Manafort, with some of the other figures on the Trump team, and their deep ties to Russia. And I think those are deeply concerning. They deserve to be fully investigated. But so far, we don't have proof of the collusion that has been suggested. And Cole writes, As the post-Soviet political system evolved in Russia, a group of billionaires and oligarchs rose from the ashes. Putin brought them basically to heel and attached himself to them as he personally became quite wealthy from what we know. Now, one of the things that Cole reveals here that I haven't seen before is that one of the charges about Paul Manafort is that the Russian oligarch, the uh, uh, aluminum billionaire who hired him for $10 million a year, told him to develop a pro-Russian television station in Ukraine. And Manafort was given $18 million by the oligarch Deripaska, and uh, the TV station never went on the air, and Manafort uh, was charged with bad faith by Deripaska, who spoke of suing him, but after Trump won the election, uh, he so far has not pursued it. Uh, Cole also cites the well-known uh, sanctions that Obama put in place that hammered ExxonMobil, a $500 billion uh, deal that uh, Rexon Tillerson had made with the Putin government. And so uh, they also, I, I also give uh, Cole, uh, Juan Cole credit because he notes the tilt of Ukraine toward the European Union was engineered by the CIA. And he says it was possible that Washington may uh, have you know, been involved in that. I think it's uh, more <laughs> substantiated than that so far. Uh, he also talks about how Adam Schiff, the ranking Democrat on the House Intel Committee, is now saying that uh, the evidence of Trump and Russian collusion is not simply circumstantial. But, of course, that is based on a leak. We don't have uh, the uh, evidence uh, that that might be based on. So I've linked to Juan Cole's piece. You can read it for yourselves, and I think it's fascinating. Another uh, incredible article that has surfaced in the last couple of days that I respect the source of here is Russ Baker and colleagues C. Collins, no relation to me, and Jonathan Larson, who teamed up on a two-month investigation at whowhatwhy.com. They've published their results in a 6,500-word article. I'll summarize it for you briefly. What they're saying is that the FBI's investigation into Trump Russia may be uh, secondary to its long-running investigation of Russian mobsters, many of whom have taken up residence at Trump Tower in New York City. Now, some of that, of course, is circumstantial. Living in Trump Tower and being a Russian or a Russian immigrant is not any prima facie evidence of a crime. But when you see that uh, this guy named Sater has been an FBI informant, an asset, for many years, and that uh, the in interesting reference the Who, What, Why article makes is to Whitey Bulger, the mobster from Boston who was an FBI informant for years, and he continued to rub out other mobsters while he was under control of the FBI. And so the suggestion from Who, What, Why is that this guy, uh, Sater, <clears throat> who uh, is, is a, you know, a, a mobster. He has been convicted of crimes in the United States. He runs a company called uh, Bayrock that he was able to uh, get control of. And so uh, this is fascinating. It's quite detailed. And again, while it does not prove that, uh, you know, Russia manipulated our election, it shows that Donald Trump has been consorting with Russian mobsters for quite a long time, and that, like we say, many of them live or work at Trump Tower. This guy Sater, once he uh, had to shut down Bayrock, 
was then uh, apparently a consultant or an employee of the Trump organization. And uh, he had an office a few floors down from Trump's. And Felix Sater was said to be able to waltz up to Trump's office unannounced and uh, chat with him. So uh, there, there's great detail in this article, and I encourage you to read it. Uh, it is an eye-opener. And what I find fascinating here is that the original charges that I referenced earlier about F, the, the Russians hacking the DNC and John Podesta's emails, these really pale in comparison to what we are uh, seeing surface from some good, solid reporting in the last few days. Uh, a loyal listener and a guy I interact with uh, on Facebook and via email quite a bit, Ian Berman, published a piece at Juan Cole's website, informed comment, over the weekend, and he warns Dems should be careful about using the deep state to get at Trump. He cites Michael Moore's call to shut down the government and to block any legislation or further nominations by Trump until all of this is cleared up. And he says the thesis is a mere allegation of wrongdoing justifies effectively shutting down a government. But do Michael Moore and Democrats believe the Republicans wouldn't make or even fabricate allegations and use the same tool going forward? Well, that's a very power, powerful point there, Ian. And uh, he notes that uh, we still have not seen any evidence of wrongdoing. That is accurate. And he comments, the supporters of the Trump investigation are forgetting this FBI is still essentially the same political organization that was created by J. Edgar Hoover. Have we forgotten about COINTELPRO? Today, the FBI spends tens of millions of dollars identifying potential terrorist suspects, giving them a plot to execute and the resources to do so, and then arresting them to show they're stopping terrorists. I think I've heard that described on the Peter B. Collins podcast. <laughs> Nicely done, Ian. Nicely done. Now, speaking of the deep state and the FBI, which I have, have regarded as a rogue agency for many years, there's a great piece that Spencer Ackerman wrote for The Guardian, published last week. And I've held on to it because I was hoping to track down the subject of this story and get an interview with Saeed Barodi, who was fired from the FBI as an intelligence and uh, language analyst. He is a Muslim American. And he and others who work at the FBI are alarmed that their religion and national origins are sufficient for the Bureau to treat them as a counterintelligence risk. And they are investigated. They, are, they basically live as suspects at all times. So Barodi took a trip to see his family. He's uh, apparently a native of Morocco. He went to Morocco and Paris. He followed all the rules. He published his itinerary uh, or, or shared it with uh, his superiors as he was required. And then, while he was at the airport in Paris, a an official with the U.S. Customs uh, came up and started hassling him. And the official knew what his name was, knew that he had come in from Morocco, and he kept persisting and bothering Barodi. Now, Barodi was trained by the FBI for a situation like this to never acknowledge that he works for the FBI. And so this customs guy uh, kept pressuring him, and within the earshot of nearby travelers, he said that he knew who Barodi was, he called him by name, and he said he knew he worked for the FBI. So Barodi took three pictures of this guy on his phone. And as he expected, when he got to Dulles Airport in Washington, they detained him, they inspected his phone, and they forced him to delete those photos. All through that, he did not acknowledge that he worked for the FBI until an FBI agent showed up. And he was ultimately fired after he protested his treatment. At one point, they reassigned him to a health Healthcare fraud squad, which certainly needs uh, Muslim language skills, right? <laughs> so uh, there's also a description in here of a couple of letters that Barodi and other Muslim employees of the FBI wrote to Director James Comey. And it's shocking how he rationalizes the uh, wretched treatment of these people who should be considered key assets in the so called fight against terrorism. 
Meanwhile, in London, shades of the FBI's attempt to hack the phone of the alleged San Bernardino shooter. Well, British agencies are demanding that the company uh, Facebook owns called WhatsApp, that runs a text messaging service that's encrypted, decrypt the final message that was sent by Khalid Massoud before he mowed down people on the bridge, then ran into Parliament and knifed a security guard to death before he was killed. Now, we're told he's a lone wolf, but they've arrested, I, I think, as many as 10 people. And they now say that he sent a text message on WhatsApp moments before he began his uh, rampage. And now the Home Secretary, Amber Rudd, is demanding that WhatsApp decrypt those communications. And they really, you know, use the demagoguery. We need to make sure that organizations like WhatsApp don't provide a secret place for terrorists to communicate with each other. Yeah, our right to privacy means nothing. Meanwhile, Jamil Jaffer, who earned a lot of respect when he worked for the ACLU, is now the executive director of the Knight Center, the Knight First Amendment Institute at Columbia University. And they filed a Freedom of Information lawsuit trying to obtain information on the rules for so-called suspicionless searches of mobile devices from U.S. citizens and non-citizens who arrive at a border crossing, an airport or a physical border crossing. The, uh, ratchet, the, the inspection of phones has really increased, and it started under Obama. In 2015, there were about 5,000 searches of devices. In 2016, it was up to 25,000. And in the month of February alone, there were 5,000 device searches. What are the rules? May I resist? May I politely decline to open up my phone? Well, the answer is that uh, we're told legally we don't have a right to refuse. And I deeply object to that. My Fourth Amendment rights are valid any time I believe I'm in the United States, even if I've just arrived at a border crossing or an entry point. But this is the mission creep to police state that we're seeing where the Fourth Amendment becomes flexible, optional doesn't apply if customs asks you every day i like to stop for a second and thank the people who support my work with your subscriptions to the peter b collins podcast well i want to thank patrick gray faith peoples bob don and andrew harnack they're all main subscribers here every month they kick in a few bucks and i appreciate that I want to invite you to join them. Come on over to PeterBCollins.com. You click on the button that says Menu, pull it down. Then you click on Become a Subscriber. It takes you to the sign-up page. And in seconds, you can choose a level of support that you're comfortable with. And I encourage you to help support my work, cover the bills here. And you can do it right there at PeterBCollins.com. Interestingly, this morning, I got uh, an email from a publicist for a progressive uh, uh, book company, and uh, the offer was to get a review copy of a new book, which is called No Country for Jewish Liberals. The author is a journalist named Larry Durfner, and I, of course, responded right away that I'm interested in that. Please send me a copy. Moments later, as I was doing my daily uh, news search, I noticed at the New York Times, Larry Durfner has an op-ed. And I think the timing of this is critical because this is a liberal view, critical of the state of Israel, and it's being published during APAC week in Washington. So I give the Times credit for allowing a rare liberal Jewish voice, a rare critic of apartheid in the state of Israel, to get a little ink in the Times. And Durfner's op-ed notes that Israel's next war is always inevitable. He cites that on March 17th, Israeli military jets bombed Syrian weaponry believed destined for Hezbollah. But this time, instead of letting the attacks pass without a response, the Syrian army fired anti-aircraft missiles at the Israeli jets. Bibi Netanyahu de defended this in his uh, typical bluster. When we identify attempts to transfer advanced weapons to Hezbollah and we have the intelligence and the operational capability, we act to prevent that. 
So Durfner notes, it's considered perfectly legitimate in Israel, indeed necessary, to send bomber jets and drones to stop Hezbollah from getting advanced weapons. Hezbollah, being pledged to Israel's destruction, will act on its desire as soon as it gets strong enough. So the only thing to do is prevent it from getting strong enough. Israel is continually attacking Syria, he notes, at times killing Syrians and Hezbollah members, even though they're not attacking Israel. Then he goes on, with Hamas in Gaza, the situation somewhat different. There, no deterrence will work for long, because unlike with Lebanon, where Israel ended its occupation in 2000, Israel to this day controls Gaza militarily from without, rules its sister territory, the West Bank, from within, and keeps several thousand Palestinians from Gaza and the West Bank in Israeli prisons. I, I mean, this is pretty important to see this getting published in the New York Times, which rarely will allow a voice like this to be heard. So uh, I, I think this is uh, worth reading. I've linked to it in the show file for today's podcast, and you can check it out for yourself. On the Protect Israel front, Nikki Haley, U.N. ambassador from the United States under the Trump administration, went to APAC to pander to the Zionists. She repeated her prior threats to punish critics, critics of Israel, boasting that at the U.N. she's created a climate of fear where diplomats are afraid to speak to her about recent efforts to condemn Israel's illegal colonization of the West Bank. So at AIPAC, she said, what I can tell you is everyone at the United Nations is scared to talk to me about Resolution 2334. That's the one that Obama abstained on in early January and uh, sent Israel into contortions. She said, I wanted them to know, look, that happened, but it will never happen again. And she has threatened people who criticize Israel, saying, for those who don't have our back, we're taking names. We'll make points to respond to that accordingly. And then she proudly bragged about how she had gotten the uh, a, a Palestinian minister, uh, Salam Fayyad, uh, bounced from a U.N. job. She said, uh, until the Palestinian Authority comes to the table, until the U.N. responds the way they're supposed to, there are no freebies for the Palestinian Authority. And then channeling Sarah Palin and lipstick on a pig, she said, you know, I wear heels, and it's not for a fashion statement. It's because if I see something wrong, we're going to kick them every single time. Isn't that clever? Isn't that cute? But she went on to say, with the boycott, boycott divestment and sanctions movement, we were able to stop that when I was governor in South Carolina, and we're going to continue to take that to the U.N. and make sure they understand that's not, how, that's not what we need to be focused on. Well, with that in mind, one of the leaders of BDS, a man who I've met and deeply respect, Omar Barghouti, got brushed back by the Israelis. He was at his home on March 19th in Acre, or Acre, Israel, and he was arrested, taken into custody, released on bail the next day, but has been interrogated for at least four days. They are charging him with tax evasion. But it's pretty obvious that this is a bogus charge attempting to silence him and limit his ability to support BDS. And uh, this could be just coincidental, but Barghouti is scheduled to receive the Gandhi Peace Award on April 23rd in New Haven at Yale University. And perhaps this arrest will give the Israelis a pretext to prevent him from receiving that award. In a remarkable, kind of surprising 5-3 to three decision from the eight-member Supreme Court, Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg wrote the opinion uh, scolding the state of Texas for the standards it uses to execute inmates who can establish that they have mental deficiencies. Uh, what is now being euphemistically referred to as intellectually disabled individuals. Now, Texas tries to use IQ as the standard, and basically if it's below 70, they're considered to be, uh, you know, not uh, uh, competent. But at the Supreme Court, uh, they're saying, well, you know, any, anywhere between uh, 60 to 80, you know, uh, that's good enough for us. And uh, so Ginsburg said that the courts have to do more investigation. The case is based on an appeal brought by Bobby Moore, who's been on death row since 1980 for shooting a supermarket clerk in Houston during a robbery. 
And Justice Ginsburg notes that Moore, uh, at the age of 13, lacked basic understanding of the days of the week, the months of the year, and the seasons. He could scarcely tell time or comprehend the standards of measure or the basic principle that subtraction is the reverse of addition. But that didn't matter under Texas standards, and they're desperately trying to execute him. And the Supreme Court, at least temporarily, has blocked that. In another effort to distract people from his losses and his uh, Russia uh, complications, Trump today signed a, an executive order that essentially doesn't do anything immediately, like so many of them, but it starts the process of reversing Obama-era uh, environmental and climate policies. It lifts a ban on coal mining on public lands, and he signed this bill flanked by coal miners in a ceremony at the EPA. <laughs> oh, that's sweet. And uh, he directed the EPA to start the process of withdrawing and rewriting the Clean Power Plan. This also essentially uh, disqualifies the U.S. from continuing to par participate in the Paris Climate Accords. And it is based on really crazy, crazy bullshit notions. Number one, uh, Trump framed this around energy independence. And we only burn coal that uh, is dug out of the ground in the United States. So we are not dependent on a foreign source for coal. So energy independence has absolutely nothing to do with this. Then, of course, he claims that by lifting these onerous regulations that the coal mining industry is going to have some new rebound or renaissance. But all of the experts say, including leaders of the coal industry like Bob Murray, the chief executive of Murray Energy, he said, I, I don't really know how far the coal industry can be brought back because the loss of jobs in coal mining really is because of the shift to natural gas for electric generation and an increase in automation, which allows them to dig up more coal with fewer workers. So this is just another really uh, ugly, wrong-headed move by Trump, and uh, history will laugh at us or just express deep, deep revulsion. The uh, Steve Bannon and a few Republicans are trying to revive already the effort to repeal Obamacare. Now, Trump has said he wants to work with Democrats on health care, but as long as repealing Obamacare is the basic plan, th that's laughable. Uh, I heard Rush Limbaugh this morning talk about the uh, uh, factions that are, you know, really uh, undermining the unity of the Republican Party. And he falsely said that all Democrats are united and they're all hard left. <laughs> at, at any rate, uh, you know, this is something I just want to warn you about because they haven't given up. Uh, obviously, Bannon and the Neanderthals will propose even more. Uh, cruel and uh, draconian policies as part of a reform effort. And uh, this is the time Bernie Sanders is introducing a new single-payer bill. Uh, I don't believe that Republicans will ever embrace it. But it's, number one, the right way to go, the only way to go. And number two, it's the best position for the Democrats to hold. But, of course, the corporate Dems, oh, oh I'm sorry, they're all united and hard left. So, yeah, it, it's going to be fine. And finally today... Alex Jones issued an apology for his coverage of Pizzagate, a scandal that I have not been able to find any evidence for. And on Friday, the deadline under a threatened libel suit, Alex Jones issued a video apology, and he uh, apologized uh, to, I guess it's the owner of uh, the restaurant called Comet Ping Pong, which... Alex Jones said was a uh, sex trafficking ring uh, center, and he linked Hillary Clinton to it. Now, let me say that if anybody can provide me with meaningful and credible evidence, I will report it. I have reported, I, I've given you an interview with a D.C. madam who talked about high-ranking uh, officials in the Bush 1 administration back in the 1980s and 90s were participating in uh, sex activities with children. There is the Franklin scandal. I've interviewed Nick Bryant several times. He reported how 
Kids from Boys Town in Omaha were ferried to Washington, D.C. for sex parties with adults. So I, I want to be clear that I am uh, as opposed to pedophilia and sexual exploitation as anyone else, but I wait for facts to surface before I report on things like Pizzagate. And what is really disturbing, I'm looking at Margaret Sullivan, the Washington Post media columnist, and she, of course, takes the, uh, uh, you know, this Pizzagate non-story and the way Alex Jones worked it and then expands from there into the tin hat zone. So uh, she says if Jones were really interested in cleaning up the bilge he spreads, he would have recanted the disgusting claim that school children were not gunned down in Newtown, Connecticut, and that the Sandy, Sandy Hook uh, case is a uh, fraud. Now, uh, this is where it really, the, the virus of Alex Jones infects a lot of important and skeptical reporting. I don't take the position that children didn't die at Newtown. But I know that the real-time coverage does not match some of the massaged coverage that followed. There are questions about why information was suppressed and uh, the way they uh, you know, made it off limits to talk to the parents of the reported victims. Likewise, uh, Margaret Sullivan then throws in 9-11. She says Alec Jones would have done penance for spreading the lies that 9-11 was an inside job. Now, I've never said 9-11 is an inside job. What I've said is that the official story is bullshit. It does not square with fundamental science, physics, and physical evidence. And we know it was a cover-up and whitewash at the 9-11 Commission. But that position is hardly tenable when you have people like Alex Jones who go to the extreme and then allow a corporate media uh, writer like Margaret Sullivan to basically write off any criticism, any skepticism about the 9-11 story. Thanks for joining me today for my news and comment podcast. It's available every day on YouTube and everywhere it's free. I'm Peter B. Happy trails to you. Until we meet again, happy trails to you, keep smiling under.